Hello and welcome to this webinar delivered by the ISM Trust in partnership with Creative United. I'm Maria Vizitiu and I'm Member Engagement and Events Officer at the ISM and I'm delighted that you could join us today for this webinar. Before we begin, I just have a few points for you. You should be able to see us and you should be also able to hear us, but we can't see you or hear you. If you experience any technical difficulties, such as sound quality or any other issues, please let us know in the question box and we'll make attempts to resolve any issues. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at ism.org forward slash webinars. If you think of any questions during the webinar, please let us know in the questions box and we'll leave some time at the end to uh, answer any of them, as, as many of them as possible. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to our CEO, Deborah Annette. Thank you very much, Maria, and welcome to all of us tuning in to this webinar and to everybody who is a panelist of the webinar. We are delighted at the ISM to be working with Creative United on this webinar today. So we are going to be looking at how we work with adapted instruments for those people who may be suffering from some kind of physical impairment. And at the ISM, we are committed to inclusive music education. And we talk about that a lot in our campaigning because we're very aware that music education, if we're not careful, will be the preserve of those who perhaps come from more privileged parts of the community. And that mustn't happen. Whatever your background, whatever your physical or mental capability, you should have access to music and music education. So that's what we're really focusing on this afternoon. And I'm delighted that we have uh, panelists who are going to be talking to us, uh, really looking at musical instruments and how they can be used within a, a impaired uh, space for the uh, budding musician um, and I would like to first introduce the different panelists so perhaps you can just introduce who you are where you come from and what you do so over to you first Sophie hello I'm Sophie Ogunyemi um, I work for Creative United predominantly as the comms and marketing manager for the take it away music scheme but more recently I've been working on the inclusive and accessible music making initiative which for a very brief background, we um, started it with the forming of the Take It Away Consortium in 2018, which is a partnership between Drake Music, the OMI Trust, Youth Music, Music for Youth, Open Up Music and Take It Away. And we started with um, the first bit of major research um, to build a detailed picture of the experiences of disabled people um, with music making in the UK, which has then influenced and been the foundation of the projects that we've been working on since, which most recently include the Guide to Adapted Musical Instruments and the Accessible Instruments Challenge. Brilliant, thank you very much, Sophie. Um, and then moving on to Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Wolfson. Um, I'm the General Manager at the OMI Trust. Uh, we are a UK-based charity that seek to enable those with physical impairments, usually affecting arms, to participate fully in music making. Um, I personally have a background in secondary music education and I also uh, have a, a son who had a stroke when he was two, so he has a, a right-sided weakness, which has sort of led to me being involved in this work particularly. And uh, then if we could go to Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Morby. I am a researcher in the field of music education and disability. I've been working in the field for just over 10 years um, and I recently completed my PhD from the University of Leeds last summer. Um, I now work as an independent research and evaluation consultant, and most notably in relation to what we've been talking, or what we will be talking about today. Um, I've been working with Youth Music and the Take It Away Consortium on the piece of research that Sophie mentioned that looks at disabled people's access to music making and music education. Fantastic. And then lastly, we have Ruth Montgomery. Uh, good afternoon everyone, um, I'm Ruth and I'm a professional musician and teacher. I play the flute and I do flute teaching uh, to all 
range of students um, from early years to now diagnostic music teaching from early years to secondary level. I've been doing it in the last 20 years now, and um, I've worked in all ranges range of situation from a hearing student to children with deafness and uh, special needs. And um, in the last four years, I set up an organisation called Audio Visibility, just bring uh, music, visual art and deaf culture together, because there is a gap in this area, and um, to generate discussion and opportunity for deaf people and deaf musician into the world of music. Thank you, Ruth. And I think we have some interpreters with us this afternoon as well. Uh, so I see on my screen, Tracy. Yes. Um, and I'm not sure because my iPad only has six faces. So I'm not sure whether there's another interpreter out there, um, but we may see uh, her as we go <laughs> along this afternoon. Um, so <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. We've got a really skilled panel and I'm delighted you're all here uh, to talk this afternoon about inclusive and accessible music making. So we're going to be looking at different aspects of this and I'm going to ask different panelists to lead and then we will go across other panelists for them to add their thoughts. And there's always the opportunity uh, for those of you who want to ask a question do use the chat box. We find the chat box really, really useful and it makes the event much more engaging if everybody is contributing. So the first topic, I'm going to come to Ruth uh, to talk about uh, background on uh, music and disability. So over to you, Ruth. OK. Um... My background on music and disability, well, I focus a lot on young deaf people um, because I'm deaf myself and I was born with profound hearing loss. I've never heard a natural sound in my life, but I wear hearing aids, which enables me to hear some sound. I come from a musical family, which means um, they showed me the pathway to music and um, this door no different in anyone trying an instrument, I worked my way up to going to music college in Bath. Um, the interesting thing about music and deafness, we only have um, just a century different, which is the hit here. There's no reason why we should not be able to play a musical instrument that is available in front of her. And um, I have found that there is not enough music t-shirt taking on the opportunity to teach young deaf people music. And not only that, schools, education, they don't do enough to do music teaching in the curriculum anyway. And um, I hope that plan area will change one day. Um, that's because we are perfectly able, we are born musical and we should really pick up the instrument. People always ask, can deaf people hear their own playing? Can they hear? The thing is, everyone has different levels of hearing level. Some people may hear really well with their hearing aid or cochlear implant. Some people might find it more challenging each to their own. But at the end of the day, it's about whether they're interested in wanting to learn a musical instrument and make a career out of it. So um, are you able to talk to us a bit more about Make Some Noise and the research there? Yeah. Do you want me to start, Sarah? I don't know. Yeah, you can start. Start. Like, well, like, one of you two start. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, back in 2018, um, we kind of realised that we didn't have any data. There was no data about what it was like as a disabled person um, with making music. So we created um, a survey. Um, to find out, and we, we asked music makers, educators, and retailers um, to find out more about what the um, yeah what the current situation was like. But thinking about you know the sports um, sector, and you know you've got the Paralympics, and there's just so much more awareness out there. 
there just was not the same in the music industry. Um, and I can tell you some of the first kind of stats that came through, which was almost 60% of music retailers said that they weren't aware of any specialist products or adapted instruments for disabled people. Only 54% of music educators and less than a quarter of parents with disabled children agreed with the statement that I know how and where to source an adaptive musical instrument. Um, so yeah, it, it showed us very quickly that there are, there are massive gaps. Um, but since then, Sarah's been working on it and to make it into a report. So she's, she's I'm going to pass over to Sarah because she'll know a lot more about it currently. <laughs> No problem. Yeah, so I came on board. Um, Youth Music have been leading the kind of final stage of this particular research project. Um, and I was employed by Youth Music to do a kind of deep dive into this data that was gathered in sort of the back end of 2018, early part of 2019, uh, and really draw out some of the key findings from this and then write a report about it. Uh, it's also really important to mention that at this final stage, the research project, um, I also worked alongside eight disabled co-researchers um, who were employed on the project. Um, and those disabled co-researchers, it's a shame because we had invited a couple to sit on the panel with me today so they could share some of their experiences, uh, but unfortunately they weren't able to make it. Um, but they've really informed the interpretation of the data. So I am a non-disabled researcher myself, and I felt very strongly that it was important that the lived experience of disabled musicians fed into the interpretation. It wasn't just through my perspective as someone with no lived experience of those issues. Um, some of the top level headline findings from the research and the report will be published at the end of this month. Um, so bear with us whilst we get that out there, um, are that Pleasantly, 80% of disabled music makers say that music making is a really positive experience for them. But overall, disabled people face a myriad of barriers when it comes to accessing music education and music making. And these barriers stem throughout the whole musical journey. So right from when they're deciding to learn what instrument to play, um, right the way through to when they're trying to access the music industry if they would like to or when they're trying to make music in kind of after school uh, as an amateur or um, in kind of local ensembles for example. Um, when it comes to adapted musical instruments there's a huge knowledge gap not just on the part of music educators and retailers but also on the part of disabled musicians themselves. Only 25% of disabled music makers who responded to the survey knew where to source an adapted musical instrument if they needed one. Um, and 61% uh, of disabled music makers and their parents who didn't know where to find funding to support their music making, for example. Um, so there's a huge kind of knowledge gap and these figures are also um, quite prevalent in the data sets from the music educators and the music retailers too. They're also not too sure about what's out there. Um, and so when it comes to disabled people getting support, there's really nowhere for them to go. So the um, guide to purchasing adapted musical instruments that the consortium has just put out really a landmark publication to help bridge that gap. Um, yeah, I can share more findings if you would like me to, but I feel like I might, it's probably better for me to chip in every now and again as we kind of talk about the issues. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to just hold on to that thought there. Um, and I would like to ask you a quest question of all three, so Ruth, Sarah and Sophie. Um, when we're talking about music making um, and disability, presumably we're talking about all kinds of different types of disability. So I just wonder, Ruth, can you unpick that to start off with, the varieties of disability that you might encounter? and music making and just give us a bit more of a feel there if that's possible. Yeah, it, it can be quite common for deaf people to have a uh, vision impairment as well, but that and on another challenge, you know, the, um, children with Down syndrome can often have even a hearing, different hearing level and um, there's yes, um, Yes, so that's another thing to land on with deafness. So that in my experience, I would make music teaching 
was still just my deathbed and with the picture of the crease in the bun and um, demonstration, visual demonstration, and um, including everybody in the classroom. Them times one to one, Dan. Thank you, Ruth. And Sarah and Sophie, um, I, I presume um, that we can't, yeah, I'm just slightly concerned about talking about disabled people as if they're a, a, a homogenous group. I mean, presumably, we are thinking about different types of disability, different backgrounds, uh, poverty levels, uh, gender, ethnicity. Presumably, there's lots of different aspects here as well. So um, could Sarah or Sophie, again, just slightly unpick some of the detail here? Yeah, wow. absolutely. So um, I think one of the things that I'll point out from the very beginning is that um, I, I personally come from a perspective that acknowledges the social model of disability rather than the medical model of disability, which acknowledges that disability and impairment are two different things. So impairment is the condition that somebody might have, but a disability is not necessarily caused by the person's impairment. Um, a disability is related to social circumstances uh, within um, kind of our social systems, our education systems, our health systems, our political systems, those things that impact on people with impairments' lives. Um, so just making a quick distinction between those two things uh, from a sort of a social model and a medical model perspective. Um, you're right, uh, disabled people are not a homogenous group by any means, and there are huge amounts of diversity within um, uh, kind of the disabled community. And you're absolutely right as well in terms of uh, intersectionality, that disability intersects with um, other lived experiences, such as race, class, um, gender, et cetera, too. Um, but one of the things that we, we, we do know is that disabled people um, are kind of disproportionately affected by, uh, as a whole, by some of these issues that we've we found in, in the research background, for example, that we've, we've done with the Take It Away Consortium uh, in comparison to non-disabled people. So whilst we're, we, you know, we're not treating them as a kind of homogenous group of people, um, they do all share uh, similar experiences when it comes to access to music education. And it will vary for, for different uh, people with different types of impairment, depending on how easy it is to access say, performance opportunities, for example. Um, some of the people in responding to our research, uh, for example, said that um, it was really difficult to access performance opportunities because there's literally, like the stage itself is literally inaccessible to them. There's no ramps up onto the stage. Whereas if you, um, are not a physically impaired person, for example, you might not experience those same barriers. So yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, disability doesn't affect every disabled person in the same way. Um, what I will say is when it comes to education, 12.1% of uh, all students in England, uh, so we're not talking about Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, I'm afraid, but in England, the stat is that 12.1% of students do have either a special educational need or disability. Um, and that's a huge proportion of students who are disproportionately affected when it comes to access to education. Mm -hmm. Sophie, do you want to add anything on this point around really intersectionality here? Yeah, I was, I was gonna um, ask Rachel because the work that we did with the Nottingham schools, the, um, Rachel will be able to speak better about it than me but we it was you know we there was the one-handed clarinet that was provided but then in terms of making it more inclusive it was things like printing off large print music and things like that so Rachel do you want to say a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah so we've been working with Nottingham Music Service for the last two years uh, looking at their whole class music education provision um, and when we first approached the music service, they hadn't been told of any students. The dialogue with schools just wasn't come, you know, forthcoming towards the music service. So the teachers were arriving in September to teach the whole primary school class, with often with no information about the students that were in front of them. Um, and as Sophie said, the range of provision um, we've been able to um, 
support has been been very broad so we've got lots of students with visual impairments where as Ruth said the materials need to be presented in a larger font or in a particular colorway or whatever we've got children with autism who perhaps um, struggle with noise sensitivity and then you st stick them into a room of 30 trumpets blasting off and you know you've lost them day one so uh, things like ear defenders just to tone it down a bit so they can still participate but they're not um, you know blasted with the sound um, and then everything from um, dyspraxic students who perhaps uh, need some kind of support for an instrument so that they can concentrate on playing it and not dropping it up to uh, a very expensive 100 clarinet that allows somebody to have the full range of the instrument um, when they've only got use of one hand perhaps cerebral palsy or something like that so yeah broad range of, of um, circumstances that need to be considered and and the solution for each one will vary yeah can i also just um pick up on um another aspect of this because we've been talking quite a lot of about people who are younger but I'm conscious that disability can occur at any time of life, particularly as you become older um, and possibly suffer a stroke or perhaps you've been in the armed forces and you suffer an amputation or, or some other medical condition. So uh, how were we doing in terms of access to music making for those who perhaps uh, come to disability later in their lives? So from an OMB perspective, um, uh, as you quite rightly say, um, people fall into what I define as two categories, those who are born with a condition and perhaps never get started or find it difficult to get started because of their, uh, their impairments. Um, and then those who perhaps have enjoyed music as a professional or a keen amateur, and it's their, you know, a key part of their life professionally or, or socially. Um, and those people we find tend to try and look for solutions uh, to get themselves back into playing the instrument they played before um, so it, at the OMI Trust we have a competition at each uh, year to find instruments and many of those solutions have come from an individual who's had a stroke uh, in our very first competition winner was David Nab, professional saxophone, saxophone teacher from the States, had a stroke and worked very hard to get back into that professional life, which he has succeeded in doing despite having quite a significant um, one-sided weakness. Um, and it's really important that those people are able to um, come back into the, the role that they had. Um, and often that is um, uh, particularly important because they will have an affinity with a specific instrument. So to say to them, well, you used to be able to play the saxophone, but actually that's a really expensive, complicated thing. We can't do that, have a go at the, the trumpet. It, it doesn't work for them because that's not the instrument and the, and the musical style that they enjoyed prior to their, uh, their change in circumstances. Um, so it's something that we try very hard to support and we do have um, things like an instrument loan scheme that allow them to try solutions um, for themselves before perhaps uh, looking at an investment on their own, you know, for their own instruments. It looks as if Ruth wanted to say something, so if I come to you Ruth and then we'll go to Sarah. I just want to briefly say that yes, Rachel is right and Deborah, you're right, there are musicians who have lost their hearing later in life and they are already musicians and, and the biggest thing I've learned from them, it totally rocks their confidence in terms of having a music career or can they do this, they have hearing aids or implant, um, who changes and adjustment needs to be made, you need to take time, time to grieve and all that. But what I think is really important that you cultivate a support net network, making them believe that they can carry on and get them right. And also, I find that I need to think ahead a bit more, just in case one day I could use my hearing aid, my hearing totally. What are my backup plans? So the last 20 years, I've been looking into interesting ways in my career. It's like the while still playing the blue. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. And then over to Sarah. 
Yeah, so our um, the the Take It Away research uh, that the project that I've just been working on with Youth Music and the Take It Away Consortium uh, surveyed people right music makers right from um, age zero. So we had parents of disabled babies and toddlers uh, responding to the survey right the way through to I think our the oldest participant in the music makers research uh, music makers survey sorry was eighty. Um, so we had quite a broad perspective and a broad age range. And what we were finding from the older musicians, the kind of post school age, if you like, is that whilst there were serious barriers to accessing music education and music making for children of school age, those barriers actually were potentially worsened once they left school because access to funding suddenly gets narrower. Um, so there's lots of access to funding that might be available for children and young people or uh, kind of people in their early 20s who are just starting out in their career. Um, but post that, there's there's not many opportunities. And also opportunities to make music uh, kind of in ensembles or with other people. Very few people were accessing um, group based music making opportunities and uh, also things like open mic nights and things like that. A few people were kind of out and about. I think it was 83% off the top of my head, that might be incorrect, but it was definitely in the 80% um, of music makers overall were making music at home. That's very, very interesting. And I think that's very important that we don't just focus in on any particular aspect of disability or, in, uh, as you say, impairment. and keep our, our focus also on how much of it comes from the individual and how much of the challenge actually comes from the way society configures itself because the way society configures itself throws up lots of barriers and obstacles and all of us in our lives can make a contribution to try and remove some of those obstacles and barriers and I think it's probably all of our obligation and duty to do precisely that. So that's the first topic. Um, we will now move on to um, adaptive music, a musical instrument. So again, we're going to be uh, focusing in on, let's find out about adaptive musical instruments. I have to say, I know very little at all. Uh, so hopefully uh, we are going to be hearing from Sophie and Rachel, who are going to be taking us through this. Yeah. Start. <laughs> yeah. okay. So um, the OMI Trust, as I've said, is very focused on those with physical impairments, typically affecting arms uh, and hands. And that's because if you think through any instrument you can you can think of pretty much, I can guarantee that you will need 10 very dexterous fingers to be able to play it. So if they don't exist or you haven't got the fine motor control, you're a real a disadvantage before you start. Um, so the OMI competition that I mentioned um, is about finding instruments that are capable of all that the standard instrument can do but without the use of one hand or arm and the reason for that is that uh, music is written very much um, for you know based on a particular instrument being able to play a particular styles uh, a particular range of notes and if you limit any of that you're you're you know, you can start playing your clarinet or whatever, but you then go to your big band and you find that you can't play half of page three because it's in an octave that you can't reach or you can't play that set of notes that quickly. So, you, you know, you're stuck. Um, people are not um, in pigeonholes, so I can't say that everybody who uses our service doesn't have one hand, but it does encompass a group of people. And by encompassing a group of people, um, it means that uh, we can find solutions that are more helpful uh, and hopefully by having a larger market for those instruments that will help bring the cost per instrument down because we've got more people who can benefit from them. So there's a sort of, um, you know, cost saving there to, to helping people uh, access those instruments. Um, so that's that's kind of where we've started at. Obviously, there are people who have no arms or have use of uh, six fingers, but not 10. And once we've got solutions to our competition, we're able then to make contact with makers who can perhaps rework those for a bespoke solution for a particular individual um, to help them. Some of our equipment is incredibly expensive. So our one-handed clarinet that I've mentioned a few times is £6,000. Uh, some of our equipment is not expensive at all uh, and another thing that we're trying to do is improve 
improve the uh, the range of instruments available. So uh, lovely £6,000 clarinet is a beautiful African blackwood instrument with silver plated keys. We do have two in Nottingham in whole class ensemble tuition, but uh, where we've got, uh, another, and we're working on a sort of entry level version of that, uh, and one where we've been slightly more successful in, in that range of instruments is the recorder. So uh, Dolmetsch produced a recorder in the mid 90s, which is rosewood and gold plated keys. Uh, we have now got a plastic version based on an Aulos recorder, and we've also uh, developed a 3D printed version, which um, is still you know, it's still significantly more expensive than the plastic recorder that every other person in the class will have. Um, but it's a, a lot more affordable and it uh, provides the pro progression of instruments that, you know, your your beginner violinist will have their cheap factory made violin and the option then as they progress up to their Stradivarius or many options in between. So we're constantly trying to expand their range so that people can have that starter instrument but having learned the technique, it then applies to the instruments that are made out of, uh, you know, higher quality materials um, to progress. Um, and in terms of uh, availability, uh, we do have a higher scheme that people can use to access the instruments and try them out. Uh, and we do have links with makers who, who can make things for you. They are generally made in small numbers and uh, by artisan individual makers. So uh, instruments generally aren't cheap. Um, but that is something we're working with Creative United on in the Accessible Instruments Challenge at the moment to try and improve that position. Um, and it's one of those chicken and egg things because the demand isn't high, because people don't know about them. People perhaps think music making is not something that's uh, possible for them. They don't ask and then we don't get the demand through that, that justifies a higher production rate. So we're working on that at the moment and, and events like this today are, are very helpful to um, raise awareness for individuals and for those that might be teaching them uh, in the coming months and years. Um, I want to come back to that issue around profile because I think that is an issue we need to have a look at a bit more um, and how do the people who actually need an adaptive instrument, how do they know where to go? Uh, but firstly, I'd like to go to Sophie. Well, I, I can answer some of those questions. Um, we're hoping that the guide that we published in June um, is that place to go to find, um, you know, as, as there's over 80 instruments there, which include music tech and accessories and also link to other resources like what the OMI Trust has on their website and Drake Music, as well as Music for All. But it kind of all came together because from from the original make some noise um, research that's you know that was sixty percent of retailers didn't know where to find adaptive musical instruments or that they were even there. Um, just from talking to partners, talking to people on forums, we realised that there is a lot out there. You just have to know who to talk to and what to look for. Which, if you've got no prior knowledge, is very hard. <laughs> So we started collating everything that we were coming across um, with this aim to produce the guide um, as a resource for everyone, so teachers, parents, retailers alike. Um, and yeah, we, we, we published it. <laughs> but we know that it's it's not intended to be an exhaustive list because you know it was the first, it's the first edition and there's new products and prototypes that are constantly being developed and launched. So this is kind of a call to the audience. If you if you've got any experience or you know suggestions of instruments that we could include in the next edition, then please do let me know because we can absolutely add it to the next the next edition of the guide. So a couple of questions from that. Um, obviously, we've got Omi here this afternoon. Are there other charities out there um, who we should? just uh, talk about or touch base on who are also uh, promoting adaptive instruments? Are there other organisations that we should just mention? Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> go, 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 Rachel. <laughs> okay. Um, so some of the uh, other Take It Away consortium partners uh, include Open Up Music. Uh, they have some equipment that they've developed themselves and their target audience are children in special schools um, and getting music making and particularly ensemble music making going in special schools using 
a range of adapted equipment. Um, and then there's also Drake Music, um, who tend to uh, focus on the sort of music tech side and the more bespoke uh, instruments developed for an individual to meet the, the needs and their, their physical needs and the musical interests that they have as well. Um, there's, there aren't hundreds of organisations, so there's plenty of room for others to, to be involved uh, to support this, this area of work, but there are some good organisations out there. Um, Ruth, is, uh, are there any other organisations you'd like to give a shout out to? About the adaptive about adaptive instruments, instruments. Yeah, about not really, not a lot. No. Okay. My next question, uh, again, still on adaptive instruments. Um, I'm interested in just how much the exam boards are engaged within the issue of adaptive instruments, either in terms of signposting uh, would-be musicians or in terms of thinking about their own accessibility when it comes to the curriculum. Uh, any thoughts on that? So all some of the students we've uh, had uh, going through the exam system, because our focus has always been on instruments that are capable of doing the same uh, level of performance as standard instruments, the exam repertoire hasn't been an issue at all. Uh, we haven't got students to very high levels yet, so there's you know potential for for issues later on. But at the moment we haven't, um, and we've certainly worked with ABRSM and Trinity um, over students going through uh, with um, perhaps support to get into the exam rooms, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's probably all my experience. I don't know if any okay. of the others have got ideas. Sarah, I think that's a really great question. One. Oh, right. Sorry. Is that Sorry. Sophie or Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Sophie. I can go. I think that's a really great question and I'm not sure I know the answer, <laughs> but for example, an example that's come to mind is um, the P instrument series. So the P bone, the P cornet, they're, they're plastic um, brass instruments that have been created by the Warwick Music Group and they're brilliant. They're not even just for disabled and non-disabled musicians alike um, and I know that they have been accepted as a, a stat of with a, I'm not explaining this very well but ABRSM um, accepts them on their their exam um, exams. Right, Sarah, <laughs> say something. Yeah, so uh, we, we know historically from kind of research in this area that was done prior to the Make Some Noise research um, so I'm thinking of Adam Ockelford, Graham Welch and Sally Zimmerman's PROMISE research, for example, the provision of music in special education, that's what PROMISE stands for. Um, we know that historically, uh, particularly for children in special schools, um, there's kind of a lack of accreditation options for those children and young people. Um, and then obviously once they leave school, that's still there for them. One of the things that came out of the Take It Away research though is um, the kind of attitudes and expectations around what constitutes an instrument and an, then what's an adaptation um, also get in the way of this. Uh, so what we kind of found was that um, we asked, I think, 122 of the music educators who responded to the music educators survey worked for a music education hub. Um, and we found that only 27% of those music educators reported that the um, music hub that they worked for had any kind of specialist equipment or adapted instruments as part of their instrument loan scheme. But the ones that did say that they had it, when we asked them to list what specialist equipment or adapted equipment they had, included things like sound beams, iPads, scoogs, and the clarion. And these are all instruments in their own right, not necessarily adaptations, but they've become associated with being accessible instruments and therefore kind of get leaned into the just for disabled people category. And what our co-researchers, um, the disabled co-researchers who were working on the project, a really important point that they made was, is that when we come to talking about accreditation and when it comes to the options that are available for people, these kinds of instruments are instruments in their own rights, not just adaptations. And so they should be available for everybody to play. And it would be amazing if exam boards that exist already could open up 
um, the opportunities for people to get grades on these instruments. So it doesn't just help disabled people, but also helps non-disabled performers who might want to learn how to play a skoog or a clarion, for example. There's a lot of um, options for kind of creativity and development in this area, I think. Excellent. Well, that neatly takes us on to the third topic, which is inclusive practice. So how do you work with adaptive instruments? How do you work with the musician, so the youngster or the older person, in terms of accessible music making? Um, and how does that then lead into the professional aspect of music making? So, uh, shall we start with Ruth, um, if that's okay? So, Ruth, uh, your views on inclusive practice. Okay. Yeah, the word um, inclusive, inclusivity is a very interesting word. For example, I'm here today and there is a stand there which interpreter and I know from text messages that a lot of my friends are watching the webinar and they are deaf people with deaf friends with the interpreter here today. They are going to watch it. So that's a good example of inclusivity. And um, there's no captions here, so there's Dan language interpreter. Um, it's such a huge topic, to be honest. Um, people, direct deaf people, rely on vibration. Yes, uh, vibration is one part of hearing music and feeling music. And um, for example, I worked on a project with a dressed art rider who is profoundly deaf. And she rides on her horse around the world. But there is dressed out freestyle where you dance to move it. You need to get your horse to dance in time to move it. But because she's deaf and she can't really hear the music to be able to dance into, I've introduced in this dump jacket, which is like a jacket that um, gives vibration to the music. So you can feel that. And her performance increased so much that she was able to ride and dance with her horse in, in time to move it. Those are the things that I think for me, um, inclusive practice mean looking for a solution around a problem or a barrier. So um, it's not that we can't do it or don't want to do it. What can technology do to bring power into our lives? Um, and it's not just that, um, for example, if people listen to the Moonlight Donata by Beethoven by hearing it, you can't help but feel really deeply affected by the emotional styles that the music can give. But for me, when I watch Stan language, in my eyes, it's like, wow, that's incredibly powerful. So if we are talking about music, you can combine the two to describe what music is through Stan language. And this is the area I want to make more aware of, and that in my work with audio visibility, so um, we had an exhibition of music painting and somebody get their phone and um, there's the pop-up screen, you know, QR reader, there's the pop-up screen with the stand language person standing about the music painting, describing the emotion of the music. And, um, but in education, if you're reading a book, for example, you can be worse here. But there's no difference when you're looking at a music here music and words are just ways to write and think down to include the practice I think about awareness and commitment to making things possible for those who are differently angry. Thank you Ruth. Um, I'm just going to come to Rachel next um, if that's okay. Thinking about inclusive practice are there any aspects of that that you think um, people watching this webinar should be particularly aware of? Um, like Ruth said, I think a lot of it is about awareness. Um, to give you a couple of examples, um, we uh, a few years ago we asked some of the music hubs what their provision was for 
for children with physical uh, impairments uh, and we had a, a, a policy back from one of them that said all children are welcome at our ensembles well that's a fantastic ambition but if when they get there they can't get through the door or there's nothing that they can physically play then what so it's it's being aware that maybe you don't have all the answers but trying to work towards that um, and another example um, is uh, a, a, my son used to sing in a choir and it was a choir where they did lots of choreography uh, and even though to my knowledge, he was the only child that had an upper limb impairment. They insisted on doing all the choreography with their right hand and my son couldn't do that. So then when they had the choreography of a choir of 100 children, he always looked, he was always sort of trying to use his left hand to be his right hand, but it never quite worked. So just those being aware. Um, on, on a more positive uh, story, um, there are a couple of uh, girls we know in the state who have no arms they were born with without their arms at all uh, and play the cello with their feet and they play completely standard instruments they're just supported on a on a on a wooden stand that allows them to play they've got a special um 3d printed co uh, cover on their bow that they can grip with their toes and they just play the same as any cellist you might see in a school and they went to their uh, orchestra for uh, at what turned out to be a blind audition uh, blind in the sense that the the judges of the audition couldn't see the people uh, and they were both accepted into the orchestra and when I went to see them perform they came on a UK tour a couple of years ago there were these two sisters at the back of the cello sections with their cellos on the floor playing the music the same as everybody else so actually what we're trying to achieve as musicians is to give anybody that comes our way access to the music uh, style, the musical level, the, the instrument that they're interested in as best we can. Um, and I don't think any one of us here have all the answers, but what we always say, or what I always say to people who come my way is if, if you are interested in learning something or, or in you know exploring something, let's work on it together. Because if we can find a solution for you, then the next person who comes along and asks that same thing, we can we can find it. Uh, we, you know, we've got it for them too. Um, in terms of our whole class work with Nottingham Music Service, um, this uh, has been something that uh, we've now had one year of participation in. Unfortunately, due to the dreaded C word, uh, we didn't get to the end of the year and sort of really follow up with what happened with the instruments that we supplied. Um, but I think from uh, as far as we did get through the year, we found that the children were able to participate fully with the adapted equipment. But in some cases, uh, for example, the clarinet, the fingering was different so that so the teacher was um, took a little bit of time just to get the uh, student with the different instrument, you know, gave him a little bit more one to one support than perhaps some of the other students just to help him with the fingering so that he could then play E or D or whatever it was that the class were learning um, more easily. So, again, it's, some of the equipment um, will require more of that than others if it's just a supportive stand on a trumpet or something, then the, the the child or the adult can probably just um, fall in with everybody else into school, but some of it will require that little bit more understanding. And, and we haven't really talked about um, people with uh, autism, and that's certainly not one of my areas of expertise, but it is something that we've come across more and more within our Nottingham work. And just um, as a teacher, having an understanding from the school as to what the child responds to or really doesn't respond to will help keep that child in a whole class uh, situation. Uh, so so for example, there was one child, uh, we, I was told that they really don't like being, um, uh, you know, standing out. It would be very easy as a teacher to go, oh, let's hear someone see, oh, let's hear your see and encourage him to be participating in the music. And then you've just hit that button that's going to put him off music for the whole of the rest of the year. So just trying to get as much out of schools in those contexts um, to help you um, play on the child's strengths and not not get that trigger that's really going to put them off off music making for the rest of the year it's really important schools always seem to think that um, that information doesn't need to be shared with music teachers but I, I really think it's an important thing um, to, to try and draw out of schools where it's possible thank you very much Rachel I am conscious that we are beginning to run short on time so Sophie and Sarah just briefly 
your thoughts on inclusive pra practice. What are your top thoughts in this area? Sophie first. I think there just needs to be creativity involved. I mean, thinking about traditional instruments in particular, I have an adapted flute. And if my flute teacher and my mum hadn't come together and thought, OK, well, why can't this key just be moved and like extended a bit? And why does the foot joint have to be at this angle? Why can't it be like that? Then I could play so much easier. I've got very little fingers. Don't, they're not very long. Um, <laughs> and it, yeah, it's just thinking outside the box, like with the cellos. Why can't a cello be played with the feet? Why, why does a, a violin have to be played like this? Why can't it be played downwards? So think brainstorm think about it the guide should help it should give some ideas but it's it's going to be different for everyone for everyone's individual needs so really this is an opportunity for music teachers to use their creativity yes in terms of uh adaptability sarah what are your 100%. thoughts um i think creativity is is hugely important but i also think something rachel said is uh, incredibly important as well and that's that's working on this together um, quite often, I mean, you know, I think quite often as music educators, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to know everything about the, our instruments and, and have all of the answers so that we can effectively teach the students that we teach. Um, but when it comes to a student who might not be able to access an instrument in what's seen to be a traditional way, um, working on kind of addressing those barriers with the student uh, is crucial and communication and just talking about things, uh, asking about access issues uh, and kind of trying to create an open dialogue about that uh, is, is one of the first steps, I think. Um, work with the disabled person that you are teaching and you will be able to come up with solutions together to the problems that you're facing. Fantastic. Um, I hope that we may have one or two questions. We've got five minutes left. So I'm going to Hello. ask Maria. Maria, are you out there somewhere? <laughs> I am, I am, yes. Hello, we do have a couple of questions and I'll, uh, I'll tell, attempt to, to read some of them now. Um, so one of the first ones is, um, someone said they saw the adapted cello. Is that the same for violins? Do you know if there's any adapted violins out there? Um, I, I'm not aware of adaptive violins as such, although we do have various bow holders and one of the accessible instruments challenges also to work on a violin bow holder. Um, the advantage of the cello uh, is that the spacing of the notes is such that toes can reach them, whereas uh, a violin, obviously, the notes are quite close together. So um, I, I'm not aware of that. Um, one of the things we use in whole class teaching in um, Nottingham for violin is called an artifon, and it's kind of the music tech route. Uh, so the artifon looks like the neck of a guitar, it connects to an iPad, but uh, you can use it just with one hand or what actually one digit. Um, you can put it on the table, you can put it into any position that's convenient, and it allows um, children to to use the same point in the string you know the, the the note is in the same position on the string as it would be on a standard violin um, it's probably not going to take you um, it's a sort of entry level instrument you're not, not going to be able to play the mental violin concert on it but it does allow access at the, those early stages so it's something to look at if you're a violin teacher looking for something um, helpful Perfect. So there Thank might be much. space out there for somebody to make an adaptive violin by the sounds of things. Definitely. Uh, string, a challenge. A challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Maria, next question. Lovely. Um, next question is from someone asking if there are any um, training routes to teaching music with people with uh, disabilities or impairments of any sort. And also, are there any um, standard qualifications that apply or are there any different qualifications that someone might need to take? In terms of like teaching qualifications, sorry, that's what I meant. Sarah, do you want I'm... to pick this one up? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's not my area of expertise, but I can certainly point people in the direction of some um, kind of training courses. Uh, say, for example, uh, Drake Music um, do kind of online training and support for organisations. I would thoroughly recommend checking out their website and in particular the Think22 programme, um, which is a, a kind of youth music funded project that Drake Music are working on at the moment. Um, also uh, kind of in the sort of Birmingham area, I believe it's still happening in the Birmingham area. Um, there is, uh, 
can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but it's linked to the Sounds of Intent framework of musical development. And again, if you're not too sure what that is, I recommend a Google. Um, <laughs> it's a, a development framework um, which looks at the way in which uh, children and young people labelled as having profound and multiple learning difficulties develop musically. Um, and Adam Oppelford and uh, uh, a kind of group of other researchers, I believe, also offer training on how to use that framework in your teaching and how it can be applied. And as I say, I believe that's what's currently in uh, connection with, uh, I think it's Mac, Mac, Mac Makes Music in Birmingham, but I might be wrong on that. Um, so yeah, definitely check out that too. So take the postgraduate certificate. There we Sorry. go. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, just say that again for us so that we all heard. It's a postgraduate certificate in Sounds of Intent, or postgraduate certificate anyway, in whatever it's in. Right, okay. Uh, anyone Perfect. else got anything to add on the uh, qualifications route? I think not in terms of qualifications, but I think Grey Eye um, do some training, which could be useful for looking into. They, they do more theatre stuff, but I think in terms of um, working with young people, that might be a good place to start. Okay. Um, other questions, Maria, or have we covered everything? Um, we have another one. Um, someone is asking if, uh, by any chance, cancer has been seen as a has been regarded as a as a disabil disability, since under the Equality Act it is regarded as a disability. And if anyone has explored um, in something like this in in these projects. Yeah, so I can say that from the Take It Away uh, research, um, cancer was included. Uh, I believe the category in which cancer came under, though, was defined as other, and then in brackets, uh, which includes cancer, HIV, and other kind of uh, chronic illnesses. Um, those categories potentially need a bit of a revisit if we were ever to do that research again. Um, and in kind of compar in comparison, in conjunction with disabled people, kind of talking about terminology and how we're grouping people, uh, those things are always really important to consider with the community that you're trying to support. Um, but no, 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 it was definitely uh, included. I cannot say how many people from the survey sample um, had cancer uh, or were cancer survivors, um, but yes, they were definitely included in the Make Some Noise research. Mm. And definitely, I, on, I, I, I was just going to say, I think this is a really important point, and I speak as somebody whose previous life was as a discrimination lawyer, and I did quite a lot of work around disability. It's really important that we understand disability in its broadest sense. So, um, you as a lawyer, you will see disability not just in terms of something that might have happened to you, for instance, amputation, but definitely is something that may arise from an illness. And so it sounds as if that, that piece of research needs to be extended so that um, we have a better understanding of what disability is within the music making fraternity. I'm not so sure if it needs to be ex extended. I think that it did. The research did reach um, a, a wide variety of uh, people with um, different impairments and uh, chronic illnesses and things like that. I think it's more the way that those were categorised. So, mm -hmm. for example, some of those categories were kind of learning disability, for example, or uh, mental illness. And under those very broad um, kind of uh, descriptors could be a variety of um, different experiences. And so I think it's that that we really need to, to look yeah. into to make sure that we're not misattributing um, lived experience to, you know, kind of people with a very broad uh, level of lived experience. Yes. I'm just thinking of, you know, for instance, uh, multiple sclerosis will lead to some form of disability, and that is obviously uh, uh, an ongoing disease. So I think we just need to be very sensitive around all those different nuances there. Um, yeah, any other contributions at this point? Yeah, I think one of our last one is to kind of clarify where we can download the um, the guide to adaptive instruments from and if there's a, a website that people can look at anything like that okay yeah. so um, i'm going to go to each of our panelists just to say two more words so if there is a link you think people should be going to mention it there so first to rachel any good links you would like to direct people to 
of course, the OMI website. Uh, so our website is www.ohmi.org.uk and there's lots on there about instruments and contact with us as well. Brilliant. Next up, Sophie. Good links. Yes, I would recommend the Take It Away website, which is www.takeitaway.org.uk and you can download the Guide to Adaptive Musical Instruments there. Fantastic. Sarah, Sarah thanks. <laughs> Um, I would recommend both of those things as well, but also stay tuned for uh, the release of the, it, we're calling it the Make Some Noise Research, but that's not actually going to be the title because it infringes on the copyright of another organisation. So <laughs> <laughs> um, but stay tuned for that. Youth Music will be publishing that at the end of the month. So make sure that you follow Youth Music's channels, um, their Twitter and their websites to make sure that you have access to the full research report. Brilliant. Fantastic. Good links, Ruth. <laughs> um, I would like to mention Audio Visibility, which is my company. There is www.audiovisibility.com and it's about music definition and visual art coming together. Um, there are other organisations that are very committed to working with young deaf people and that's the Music of Life Foundation and the Music and the deaf charity in Yorkshire. Brilliant, fantastic. Might I also add one more, sorry, I completely forgot to mention as well that um, currently in this sort of COVID-19 environment with the arts sector uh, being what it is at the moment, there is also a campaign being run by uh, disabled um, artists and creators uh, and musicians called We Shall Not Be Removed. Um, I thoroughly recommend that people follow that hashtag on social media to find out more about that campaign, which essentially is um, campaigning for any regeneration within the arts sector to be inclusive. Yeah. Fantastic. That is a wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Ruth, Sarah, Sophie, Rachel and our two interpreters who have been absolutely magnificent. I have really enjoyed this webinar. I hope you all have enjoyed it, those people out there watching it. So thank you very much indeed and follow up those links. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.